All right, folks, welcome to the next exciting video. I'm sure you guys are loving this already. So today we're going to talk about Mesopotamia and Egypt, two of the famous river valley civilizations. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. So the first civilization we're talking about is Mesopotamia. And that is Mr. Nolan's head on one of the Mesopotamian gods. So here we go. Geography of Mesopotamia. Okay, Mesopotamia means the land between rivers. Okay, so the area that we call Mesopotamia is in between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. So on your little maps, you want to fill out that the Tigris River is right there, the Euphrates River just a little bit under it, and then when we talk about Mesopotamia, we kind of mean this area that's kind of in between the Tigris and Euphrates River, uh, kind of the area in between and around it. So this is kind of the birthplace of civilization. This is where the first kind of big cities, big civilizations started to pop up thousands of years ago. Okay. So the rivers flooded at least once a year. Okay, the Tigris and Euphrates flood at least once a year, but the flooding is unpredictable. Okay, so they didn't quite know when it was going to flood. Um, there was long periods of little to no rain, so life was kind of difficult for these people around the Tigris and Euphrates River because of this unpredictable flooding. Now, the floods do leave behind fertile soil, okay, and this is going to help them farm, and this is one of the reasons they're able to create these big cities in Mesopotamia. Okay, they're going to create and grow wheat and barley. That's going to be what they eat for the most part. Okay, so when we're talking about the geography of the region, as you can see from this picture, this picture is a picture of um, the Euphrates River. Okay, so you can see it's kind of flat. There's not a lot of mountains. You don't really see much desert. Um, or other big bodies of water. Um, it's just kind of the river and then flat land all around. So there's no natural barriers to protect from invasion. Um, there's not a whole lot of natural resources in the area, as you can kind of see. So they have to innovate to survive. All right, so how do they innovate to survive? The first thing they're going to do is something called irrigation. Okay, very, very important, irrigation. So they're going to do this thing called irrigation, which means they're moving water from the rivers into the fields. Okay, so you can see from these pictures here, um, there's rivers out here, and then they move the water in through these channels, okay, and then that's how they get it into the fields. All right? So in addition to that, they're going to create mud bricks to build walls around their cities. Um, so we said there wasn't a whole lot of natural barriers. So they have to build walls to protect themselves from invasion. And they're going to trade grain, cloth, and tools with neighboring people for their natural resources. Okay. So as you can kind of see from these pictures here, this is how a, maybe a Mesopotamian farm would look like. We'd see kind of water flowing in to the farms from the river. And that's how they'd kind of keep their farms up to date. So they're going to develop a form of written language known as cuneiform. Um, this is basically when they kind of get rocks or big tabs of rock and they kind of hammer little symbols into it and that's how they keep track of records and keep track of writing. Um, one of the famous written things that they created was the Code of Laws. It's called Hammurabi's Code, uh, which we'll probably get into more later in the year. Um, advancements in geometry and architecture. As you can see here, this is called a ziggurat. We're going to talk about it in a couple slides, but basically they were able to create large but impressive buildings. They developed the wheel. Okay, so now they don't have to carry everything by hand anymore. They can go ahead and wheel things around. This makes it easier to farm. This makes it easier to build things. This makes it easier to just kind of live life. So the wheel is very crucial. And they're also going to use bronze tools, uh, which help in farming, uh, good for weapons, uh, make things a little bit easier as far as technology. Okay, the next thing, social structure and government. So the key thing to understand about Mesopotamia is that it's organized into city-states. What is a city-state? It's basically a city and the area that surrounds it. Okay, so this is like a small country. All right. So if Patriot High School was a city-state, it would be called Patriot City-State, and we control the school, and we control the area around it. We control the football field. We control the tennis courts. We control the baseball field. 
even though nobody cares about baseball, especially not Mr. Nolan, because baseball is, let's be real, not as much of a sport as tennis. All right. Anyway, they're going to be organized into city-states. So you see Kish here, you see Uma, you see Yurik, you see Ur, okay? Babylon might be a city-state you might see pop up. All these city-states kind of vie for power and kind of, you know, skirmish with each other a little bit. They compete with each other. All right. Once you're in a Mesopotamian city, the ziggurat is the place of worship, okay? It's basically the place where people go to worship their gods. It's where the government officials will kind of rule from. Okay, that's what city hall means. It means the place where the government is run. And the social structure of government. All right. Mesopotamian kings are representatives of the gods. Okay, this means that the gods gave them authority to rule. Okay, something called... Uh, the divine right to rule, which we'll go into later, the mandate of heaven. But the main social order, you see kings and priests at the top. Okay, religious people are going to be very important in this day and age. Merchants will be next, large landowners, maybe soldiers, and then kind of the lowly farmers, the lowly commoners, and then slaves. Okay, slavery, a big part of society. Um, they're going to be at the bottom of the list. So Mr. Grimsland would probably be up here somewhere as a king or a priest, okay, whereas perhaps Mr. Mr. Nolan, um, just a lowly commoner, unfortunately for him. All right, Egypt. The next civilization we're talking about is Egypt, okay? So you might know Egypt for the pyramids, you might know it for kind of the great sphinx, uh, which is on the right, or you might know it for the great Mr. Nolan sphinx, which is on the left. So the geography of Egypt, okay? It's located on the Nile River, this big river that goes through Egypt, all of Egypt, is called the Nile River, okay? The Nile floods at the same time every year, so it's predictable. Remember, we said Mesopotamia was unpredictable flooding. Now the Nile is predictable, and it's going to leave a layer of silt behind, something called silt, which is basically a type of mud that helps plants grow, so it makes farming easier. And deserts provide natural protection. Um, the Sahara Desert is to the left. It provides natural protection. Um, and it also prevents people from the Nile from spreading to other regions, really. So you might be wondering why Lower Egypt up here is on top, whereas Upper Egypt is on the bottom. Okay, here's the reason. This area that is called Upper Egypt on the map is kind of higher in elevation. Okay, so it's more mountainous. So the Nile River flows downward, okay, because water flows downhill, and it flows down into what we call Lower Egypt. So the Nile River starts up here in Upper Egypt, and then it flows downhill into the Mediterranean Sea. So that's why Upper Egypt is on the bottom, and Lower Egypt is on top. So, the innovations of the Egyptians. What did they do? What did they create? First thing is papyrus, okay? Papyrus is basically a, a bunch of reeds that they kind of weave together and they create paper so they can write on it. They can have scrolls, they can keep records, they can do religious things on paper. Okay, so papyrus, very key. The other thing is how do they write on the paper? Hieroglyphics, okay, it's the Egyptian writing system. I'll show you a picture in a second. Okay, hieroglyphics, the Egyptian writing system. And then lastly, they create the massive buildings known as pyramids. Okay, these serve as burial sites for their pharaohs, okay, and important officials. So this is a picture just of hieroglyphics. You see kind of, uh, it's a combination of pictures and symbols. Um, and this is, would be how they keep track of writing. Um, there would be a picture basically for the different types of words and phrases that they would use. All right, so the social structure of... Egypt, okay? Egypt's government is a theocracy, which means that the ruler's power is based on religious authority. So the ruler is called the pharaoh. So the pharaoh would kind of look like this statue here. He'd have a headdress on. He would probably have a lot of jewelry. And he is seen as a god, okay? So the pharaoh is god on earth, basically, okay? And that's why he has the power. He has all the power to rule because the people think that he is a god on earth. And that strict social structure that we talked about in Mesopotamia, that's going to be the same thing. So there's slavery. The pharaoh would be at the top. 
then kind of your merchants, your um, religious people, kind of your large landowners, and the bottom people would be the commoners and the slaves. And here's Mr. Nolan as a pharaoh kind of hitting on perhaps Cleopatra or perhaps somebody else. If you know what a pheromone is, you'll get that joke. So they uh, believed in the afterlife and they mummified their dead bodies. Okay, Mummified means you kind of wrap it in paper, you put some um, kind of special uh, paste, you know, paste on the body and it preserves the body. Um, so they bury their pharaohs inside the pyramids, they mummify them, um, and they believe that this will help them in the afterlife. Okay, so the Egyptians are polytheistic, meaning they believe in many gods. Um, so polytheism, poly means many. So obviously the Egyptians believe in many gods, and you'll probably get into them uh, more once we get into that in class. So here's just another picture. This would be what the inside of a tomb might look like. You'd see kind of this tomb with the pharaoh or an important person inside, and he'd kind of be buried with all his treasures and all those things like that. All right, so if you're keeping score at home, um, just remember that this is Mr. Grimsland. Thanks for watching the video. And always remember that Mr. Nolan has smelly feet. Thanks for watching.